Welcome to the Warrior Wizard Podcast with my mom, Angela Johnson. On today's episode, my mom's going to be talking about Eve. Eve? Like Adam and Eve? Yeah, Eve, the first mother of the world. Good morning. I am really excited to start a new series with you all, a new podcast, a new series. Hey, this is the t- the season of first, right? And so since this is the Warrior Razor podcast, I thought let's do a deep dive into some of the Warrior Razors of the Bible. Later on in this series, I'm going to bring in some women um, intermittently. So we'll doing we'll do a study in the Bible and then we'll have an interview. We'll kind of volley back and forth between that format. But to do a deep dive into the warrior razors of the Bible, I thought, hey, what a, what better place to start than to start at the very beginning? So we're going to dive into the life of Eve today and see how she was, in fact, a warrior razor. She was the first. She was the first woman, the first wife, the first and only sinless woman. The first woman to never have to worry about anything. I mean, she did not worry about body image whatsoever. Uh, She didn't have to worry about staying home or going to work, whether she was doing enough with her life. You know, she didn't have to worry about any of that. She was the first and only woman to live in absolute perfection. She was also the first woman to live off the land and the first woman to bear children and the first woman to know pain in bearing children as well. She did not have a doctor deliver her babies. She did not have a midwife there. She she had to do it alone with Adam, her husband. But she was the first woman to have to learn how to raise children. She didn't have a mother or a father that were before her to give her counsel. She didn't have aunts or sisters, none of that. She was the first to to figure it out all on her own. She was also the first one to be tempted by Satan as well. And so I kind of want to back up a little bit and look into the history of all of that. You know, before sin entered, the image of God was imparted to humanity, male and female. There was it was done equally. We see that in Genesis 1:27. When when woman she wasn't called Eve in the beginning, but when a woman was first uh, entered into the this, this scene of humanity, it was because God saw that it wasn't good for man to be alone. So he decided to make, uh, it says the word, a helper suitable for him. And that word helper is translated from the Hebrew word azer. And it's important to go back and see how we use those words in the Bible. So first we see the law of first mention. The very first time we see this word is when it's a description of of Eve, of this woman, and her role as a helper in Genesis 2. Azer also describes God's role as Israel's strong helper in times of trouble. It's actually used 16 times in the Old Testament. And in Deuteronomy 33, 29, I think this is a really great example of how this word is used as it relates to God as our helper says, Blessed are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you, and you will tread on their heights. Azer is also used as a powerful Hebrew military word, and it actually means warrior. So it makes sense that God would use this military language to describe Eve's role and to mobilize her into action, so to speak. When God created Eve, he created her with a mission. Adam was alone in the world. He was the only one on earth who walked with God. And recognizing that Adam needed a helper doesn't demean him as weak. It simply means that he was alone and he needed a strong teammate. Adam would need the gifts that Eve would bring, and Eve would conversely need the need Adam's gifts to fulfill her calling together so that they could bear God's image 
uh, as a team, as 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 co as counterparts. So labeling Eve as a helper also doesn't mean that she, it's a demeaning or a lesser role for her as well. So when we go back to look at that verse in Genesis, specifically one eighteen, when it says the Lord God said, "It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him." So we talked about the word helper as azer, but the words suitable for him are translator, translated as konegdo, which means facing him, which describes seeing one's own image in the mirror. So what this explains is that woman is intrinsically all that man is, yet in a feminine form, meaning she is of equal worth. In fact, she, we know that she was created from Adam's rib. The phrase from one of his ribs can be translated as part of his side. Uh, but almost every tra English translation we read specifies that part as the rib. And when I look over this, I, I sometimes when I'm in scripture, well, oftentimes actually, I'll, I'll look at a, a passage and I'll think, you know, what does that mean? Why did God specifically mention that? Or what was the significance of those words or that that framework of, of language? And so when I think about a rib, because I do have a medical background, I think, okay, God, there are 206 bones in, our, in a human body. So why on earth did you choose a rib? So Sitting here and thinking about this, I, I do have a couple theories. Uh, they, are, they are theories that I've looked up and, and found some good resources on, but also some that I feel like God kind of implanted in my own brain here. But, you know, I don't, I don't think God chose a metatarsal, which is a foot bone, because he didn't want her to be associated with being beneath Adam. And he didn't choose a cervical vertebrae or a bone from Adam's skull because he did not want her to be associated with being above him either. He chose a bone that was right in the center of Adam's frame. And he chose a curvy, protective bone that shields vital organs. You know, I don't think there is any mistake in that. Uh, God is always so intentional and nothing is mentioned in the Bible without purpose. God, when he used Adam's rib to form Eve, to create Eve, he used existing tissue, and he did not start from scratch. I think he did this to show that Adam and Eve were of the same substance. She was made from the same stuff that Adam was. And because of that, she was a bearer of God's image and likeness, just like Adam was. And then scripture says in Genesis 2.23 that when she, she's brought to Adam... He goes, now this, now this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Adam's response to this new creation that was brought before him, I think, is to recognize that she is like him, yet she is different. I think it's very interesting that he does not call her male or another man as being like the same kind as him. He specifically calls her woman and he recognizes her origin that is from him, you know, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But he also recognizes that she is not the same as him as well. So I think God used one of Adam's ribs to make Eve as a reminder that woman was created to be beside man. Not above, not below, but beside. And it, and it illustrates, essentially, that we have spiritual equality. While we are still called to carry out our own respective feminine God-given roles. So with Eve, God brought this beautiful human relationship, this friendship, this partnership, this companionship, and this marriage into the world. I love how 1 Corinthians 11 verses 11 through 12 Paul explains it this way that man men cannot exist without women and women cannot exist without men it says in the lord however woman is not independent of man and man is not independent of woman for just as woman came from man so man comes through woman and all things come from god but we can't talk about eve without talking about the fall. And, you know, 
I think she she does get a bad rap in history that she is the cause of the, the fall of man. Sin entered the world because of her. But I think we really have to look at things in context and look at things with a critical eye, especially when we're studying to understand scripture. In Genesis 3, we see that the serpent, we know that this is Satan, he specifically seeks out Eve directly. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what did he see in her? What did this what did the serpent see in Eve? Were there qualities in her? Um did did you know he think that she was going to be because she was more nurturing maybe or more empathetic, was she more vulnerable in some way to his deception? And why did he seek her out first? Was there an opportunity? What was she doing in that moment where he went up to her and he he has this conversation with her where he brings in doubt into her mind, into her framework of, of thinking? But we don't know. We don't know a lot of that stuff. We, we have to kind of fill in the blanks with our imagination. But what we do know is that in that moment, Eve was deceived and she made a decision. She made a decision to, to follow through on that deception and not stop and check and go back and ask and say, you know, is this really the truth? Um, but what happened was Satan introduced two specific worlds words. He says, really, did God really say that, that if you were to eat of that fruit, you would die. And I think that I know I can relate to this. So you feel like you know something is true, is fact, and then someone will just ask that question in just a specific little way, and they'll say, you know, really? And then you instantly begin to doubt doubt yourself. And so then he inserts the second pivotal word when he says not. In Genesis 3, 4, he tells Eve, you will not surely die. So instantly she doubts the truth that she knows to be fact and that she knows comes directly from God, her father. She had walked with him. She and Adam had walked with God in the garden. And in a moment of deception, she is duped into thinking that, you know, maybe I do need to have that knowledge. Maybe I do. I, I, she saw it with her eyes. She saw that the fruit was pleasing. And then she, she had a lust for that. She wanted that for herself because she wanted to have that that knowledge to be on that same level, so to speak, as God. But the other thing that I find interesting about this interaction is when we think about why he went to Eve first, she was created second, right? So sometimes people might view her as being in second place or subordinate or to to live in Adam's shadow. But, you know, that was not God's design at all. But God has an order and he laid an order in creation. And what Satan did in that moment was subvert that order. And that was what led to the fall. God worked one way, man to woman, and then Satan perverted that. He flipped it and he worked the other way, woman to man. And you know what? We have been dealing with this flip-flop order ever since. In the perfection of Eden, there was equality. Once the consequence for sin entered, in Genesis 3.16, God says to Eve, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. And then he goes on to say, your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. You know, this does not mean that he would desire, that she would desire him sexually or physically. I think the first time I read, when I read that in my younger years, that's immediately where my brain went. I don't know, because my brain kind of works in that way. I don't know. But when you when you really study what the the words mean, she did not have a desire for him sexually or physically, but it meant that she, that there would be a lifelong rivalry between the sexes for dominance. It says you, you, your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. She would vie for that position of headship. She would vie to be in control and there would be an issue of abdication on part of the man. And that's why Adam essentially abdicated his role when he allowed uh, Eve to, to, to convince him to, to eat of the fruit. He wasn't responsible for her sin. He was responsible for his own. But, but when this happened, instantly there injected into the fabric of our DNA was this lifelong rivalry between the sexes for dominance. 
And we've seen it in our society. We've seen it. I've seen it in others. I've definitely seen it in myself, you know, from, from things in the media to even in my own marriage where there's this struggle for being in control. And so I think when we really have to think about Eve, how do we reframe our, our thoughts to, to view her in a positive light rather than remembering her as just this woman who messed it up for all of us? How can she be seen as a warrior raiser and not this gullible, foolish woman? After she was sent from the garden, after she and Adam are removed from the garden, they had to start over. They had to start from scratch again, the first again, the first people to live in a barren, sin-filled world. And they struggled. They had to work for every part of their future. Her life after the garden was not easy. But you know what? She she didn't give up. She didn't walk off into the sunset and say, you know, I've I've seen perfection and I've seen beauty and I don't I can't handle this anymore. She didn't give up. So I think that that in and of itself shows a true warrior spirit. And she lost it all and she kept going. Never had a woman in in all of history not, no one before her and nobody after her, quite frankly, had lived with such highs and lows. She went from living in a paradise and perfection to exile and barrenness, from perfect communion with God and Adam to the shamefulness of sin causing separation from a holy God. The moment that they knew that they had sinned, fear entered in. And they were fearful because they were naked. They felt shame instantly. In the garden, there had not been any of those emotions up until that point. But what they did instantly was they went and tried to hide. And so she had been in this perfect communion where scripture said that they had walked with God in in the evening. And they had had this communion with him. And then once sin and shame was entered, they were separated from the, from a, a, a holy God. They went from living in a place of perfect peace, not having to think about anything. They didn't even know they were naked. So they went from this place of perfect peace without a hint of deceit or evil until, you know, the serpent came into the, onto the scene. And then she ends up having to live through her firstborn son, Cain, murdering his brother, Abel. And then she essentially loses Cain as well because God ends up banishing him from his presence for for the blood-stained sin that he had committed. So Eve, she knew the entire spectrum of human emotion. And she had to keep it going. She had to keep mothering sh- children. She, Her name means uh, that she is the mother of all, that she is the giver of life. So she didn't have a choice. Well, she did have a choice, but she decided she made the choice to keep to keep going, to keep living, to keep mothering, to keep striving for uh, communion with the father. And it says that scripture says that when she finally gave birth to her son, Seth, uh, that his name actually means compensation. She said, God has given me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. So when I think of Eve, I don't fault her for her decision to eat that fruit. She was deceived, and there have been so many times where I have been deceived too. She arrived on the planet as a full-grown woman, without a mother, without a father to show her how to do things. And then she's brought to Adam, and she's instantaneously a wife. I mean, that in and of itself just blows my mind. Again, she was the first in almost everything, and that is not an easy feat. She was one of the first to experience the cost of sin, but she was also the first to hear the first prophetic message of hope in a coming Savior, one that would come from her own lineage, her own offspring. She heard the words that God spoke to Satan when, when, when God cursed Satan for his, for his deception. He said, God said to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And that's specifically found in Genesis 3.15. 
So Eve ends up being the first woman to hear of the redemptive salvation to come through Jesus. That's who that scripture is referencing, Jesus, the Messiah. I think about God creating this helper when he created Eve. But she wasn't designed to be a subordinate servant. She was designed, we are designed to be teammates, to come alongside, and to be these powerful, strong warriors too. I know that we could talk uh, on and on about so many other things related uh, to the story of Eve and Adam and the intricacies that can be woven into their relationship, you know, marriage and head of household and the conversations that can come along with that. But I think what we need to remember is that when God designed us as women, there was equality in the perfection of the garden. But after the fall, after the sin, instantaneously a rivalry for dominance entered in. And instantaneously we were, we were brought with this mentality We enter, ladies, we enter the world with this DNA that will drive and fight and claw for, for dominance. Not every one of us, I don't think is, not, not all women are bent in that direction, but there's that manipulation piece that I think if we're really honest with ourselves, it's down there, it's down there, down there deep, some deeper than others, but there is that redemptive quality of, uh, that we have in in Jesus Christ that he could take all of that. He he had to remove them. He had to remove Adam and Eve from the perfection of of Eden, but he didn't he didn't leave them. He didn't walk away from them. And that's the beauty of his word for us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So when I look back on the story of Eve, the first woman, the first of many, she was the first warrior raiser. From her, all of mankind, all of humankind. You who are listening to this podcast right now have her DNA in you. I have her DNA within me. So I think that that is something of note. Well, I just thank you guys for listening today, and I'm excited to see what the series brings and the the other warrior raising mothers that I'm going to be inviting. I'm really excited. One of the first, since we're going to be talking about the first, we talked about the first warrior raiser in the Bible. I thought it was important for me to talk about the first warrior raiser in my life, and that's my own mother. So next on the podcast, I'm going to be inviting my mom, Lynn Petrosino, on to uh, have a conversation with, with me and that you guys can listen in on. But I am just grateful for the opportunity just to share the word, and I, and I hope that it brings some truth, it brings some revelation, you can learn how to apply it to your life. And just, you know, when you think about this story, just really ask the Lord, God, is there anything in me where you want to remove that? that challenging spirit, remove that, that desire that wants to fight or, or claw my way to being out of order. And Lord, help my will align with yours. Help my will align with the perfect design that you have for me because his design is equality. His design is that we are helpers. We're teammates. We're partners in this journey and that he goes before us. And so we don't have to fight, fight our battles for ourselves. He does it for us on our behalf. So I just want to leave you with that, and and I look forward to future conversations and to all of my fellow warrior raisers, aim your arrows well. 